All right, if you've got a Bible, if you would open it up to Matthew chapter 25, uh, excuse me, chapter 15, there's not 25 chapters in there, uh, and uh, then go back three verses. Uh, I am not Pastor Mike, I'm Ron Helley, I'm uh, one of the elders, the elder, elder. Uh, they thought they were getting wisdom and maturity of years when they brought me on. Man, were they wrong. So, uh, and Pastor Mike is a good-looking guy with a little goatee uh, kind of thing. And uh, I am, but friend, I think it's because they said I have Indian blood. I can't grow any hair on my face at all. So, so speaking of Indian, I'm going to go off the reservation a little bit because last week, uh, Dr. Phil, if you hear Dr. Phil, I had the last couple of weeks. We have our own Dr. Phil. He has hair. Uh, and... Uh, so he finished at verse uh, 33. I was supposed to start at 15.1, but uh, I think these verses provide a good transition. So uh, Matthew 14, starting at verse 34. Now Jesus, remember last week, if you're here, you know, walking on the water, uh, Peter walked on the water uh, and everything. And so now uh, they reached land. It says, and when they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret, and when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made whole. Now, so interesting, I wanted to point out before we get into chapter 15, what the response of the people were. Whenever Jesus was ministering, people flocked. People came by the thousands because there was something in this man uh, that was different. And the difference was, as the Son of God, he is showing God's love toward his people. And God's love through his people, through his Son, that's awesome. That is beautiful. That is attractive. And people were drawn. And I like what it says. It said, the people heard him gladly. We get in chapter 15, we're going to see, talk about the religious leaders. Eh, not so much. Not too crazy about it. Now, being a child of the 60s, I kind of feel like part of my mission in life is to convey to a younger generation some of the things that sort of shaped our generation. Uh, so one of my favorite uh, Christian artists uh, was a guy named Barry McGuire. Barry McGuire was a uh, 60s, you know, rock guy. He ended up getting saved. Um, uh, and, uh, so I was listening to him one time, uh, I was sharing about sort of how he came to know the Lord and I can kind of relate to this. Uh, he's talking, he said that, uh, Jesus was cool. That's how we talk in the sixties. Okay. Uh, so Jesus was cool. So I wanted to be like him, but I don't want to be like all those Christians. And, uh, that hurts, you know, uh, but you know, if you think about it, Unfortunately, sometimes Christians can be an impediment to somebody's coming to saving faith. I was sharing in our community group a, a couple of weeks ago uh, at this time as I was really seeking to understand Lord. I had a born-again Christian in my organization, uh, and the most benevolent way that I could describe him was scuzzball. Uh, so he was not exactly... Uh, tripping my trigger when it comes to being interested in being born-again Christian. So uh, going on in Scripture, go chapter 15. I'm going to read just the first six verses. It says, the, Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Okay, let me stop right there. Uh, Parents, you can relate to this about not washing your hands when you eat with your kids. But uh, uh, so here is, uh, you could put this into how we relate to this today. This is like having the staff at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., coming down to Cowboy Church in Texas. They want to check it out. See, Jesus is a rabbi. He's responsible for the things that he's teaching his disciples. So they're concerned. They're coming down there. And uh, why aren't you teaching your disciples what we teach? 
So, finishing, going to verse, uh, this, this is like your kids too. Jesus didn't answer their question. He asked a question. It's like when you're asking your kids, you know, why did you do this, you know, and, or, or you tell them to do something, they go, why? And, you know, I, it's like, well, I've been, I go there with my wife, so it's, uh, I ask her a question, but, uh, okay. So, said, he answered them and said, said why do you break the commandments uh, of God for the sake of your tradition? said, for God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what, would, what you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, said, you have made void the word of God. Okay, let's stop there for a second. So what you got here is what I like to call the difference between form and substance. The Pharisees were talking form. With Jesus, we're talking substance. Now, uh, you know, these religious leaders are coming, and so what I convey to Jesus is that, okay, if you're a rabbi, you know, and you want to kind of hang with the big dogs, guys from Jerusalem, you got to kind of, kind of play by our rules. Uh, Jesus was not having any of that. So he turns it around, and instead of answering a question, he asks them a question. And this is a question that said, why by your traditions do you violate the commandment of God? Now, let's sort of put this into context here. Uh, you know, I, I was inspired by this by, uh, by Big Dan. Big Dan is our guy that was playing the drums up here, so everybody knows who he is. Uh, Dr. Phil and Big Dan are kind of more like Bible teachers. I'm kind of like a storyteller sort of thing, so bear with me. But anyway, he quoted from G. Campbell Morgan. It's like even older guy than me. Uh, and uh, so I thought, well, I should, you know, going to run with the big dog. So I read G. Campbell Morgan. He gives an interesting insights about what some of the Jewish leaders were teaching their uh, disciples. So let me read this to you said, one of the rabbis had declared the words of the elders are weightier than the words of the prophets, or as we in the 60s would say, heavy. Said, while yet another had said some of the words of the law and the prophets are heavy, weighty, all the words of tradition are weighty words. So here they are. They're taking what is laid down in Scripture, and now they're sort of adding their own little list of do's and don'ts, uh, and they're saying that this is more important than what the law and the prophets has to say. And if you remember, Jesus, uh, he said, you know, he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, not to set it aside. So what you have is these religious leaders are setting aside uh, the substance of what God had conveyed through his word over the period of many years and now establish this form of religion that they expected people to follow. Now, going on in chapter 15, so this is Jesus, after he says this to them, uh, he said... uh, you hypocrites. How do you really feel? That you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, it's interesting. The word that's uh, uh, the Greek word is translated prophecy is, uh, okay, who cares how you pronounce it? Anyway, uh, it basically means Greek to me. It said It means one who speaks forth or publicly expounds. You know, our, our, I guess, spin or whatever is, and when you hear the word prophecy, you think of something predictive that's going to happen in the future. But yet a prophet 
was speaking forth the word of God. If you read you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, and the prophets, most of what they're talking about is directed to God's people, say, turn away from your wicked ways. He's given them guidance and, uh, and tell them how they're supposed to live and to turn back to God. And, uh, and then there would be sort of forth telling, uh, but most of it was speaking forth, you know, what God wanted them to hear. So Jesus is saying, now, if you read Isaiah 29, 13, God speaking through Isaiah is speaking to his people saying, uh, you guys, your hearts are far from me. Jesus, quoting the same thing, said Isaiah was prophesying about you. And it's a neat thing. It's just as relevant to our generation today as it was in Isaiah's time, as it was in Jesus' time. The neat thing about the Word of God doesn't change. It's as relevant today as it was then. You know, people would like to uh, hear this, you know, that we as Christians, we're just sort of superstitious, you know, need religion as a crutch, and, you know, society's changed. This stuff's no longer relevant. Uh, you see how that's working out in our society. Uh, you know, it's just as relevant today and just as applicable today as it was 2,000 years ago, and Jesus said it, and almost uh, 800 years prior to that. See, Jesus, a little upset here, calls them hypocrites. Jesus never got angry at real people. Part of our vision, our vision is for this church, real people finding real hope in the real world. Jesus was a real dude, also 60s. Uh, you know, he, he was real, and people were drawn and attracted to that. And his anger was directed at people who were trying to impose upon the people of, of Israel something that was never going to work, something that was never going to be fulfilling, something that was never going to really happen to them. Now, you can tell by my shirt, uh, I was serving the Marine Corps. Marine Corps, we got, you know, we're not the sharpest knives in a drawer, otherwise we'd have probably joined some other branch of the service. You know? So we were really big on, like, keep it simple, stupid. And, you know, look at Jesus' disciples. I mean, we have, like, fishermen and tax collectors and just guys hanging out, didn't have a permanent job, you know. Nathaniel, he's sitting under a tree when he calls him. And so, uh, but, you know, Jesus keeps it simple. Now, Matthew 22, we're, we're in Matthew 15. We've been in this for over a year, so we may get to Matthew 22 probably by Christmas in which case, you're going to forget that I ever said this. So it's going to be like a brand new thing. So kind of like when my wife would get, she'd pick up movies, you know, and it's like, we saw that already, you know, but like it was a whole brand new thing. So but anyway, Matthew 22, so here's Jesus. He says, a, a Pharisee came to him and said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend, or as the King James says, hang, all the law and the prophets. Paul in Galatians 5.14 said, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. How simple can it be? This is what you do to fulfill everything that's been written in Scripture. You love God and you love your neighbor. And I'm going to tell you, you can't love your neighbor if you don't love God, okay? Uh, Jesus was the epitome of God's love conveyed. The reason he came is because by this time, the, the perspective on what God was like and what he expected was so distorted by religious leaders that Jesus came and he said, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. He came, living demonstration of the love of God for mankind. Now, it's July 4th weekend, you know, Independence Day. When you talk about Independence Day today, everybody thinks alien invasion, you know, especially this weekend, you know, Independence Day, you know, back out. Nah, it's not too bad. But Basically, this weekend is about freedom. A 
Paul wrote to the church at Galatian, he said, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to yoke of slavery. See, Paul and his ministry and our community group were reading through, going through Paul's books. We're in Philippians now. Uh, but Paul had to deal with these religious leaders that kept trying to impose this yoke of bondage on people, trying to keep a form of religion rather than the substance of a relationship. You see, religion is about someone trying to please God and get to him. Relationship uh, with Jesus Christ, Christianity is a relationship with a personal living Savior who did everything. We don't have to do anything except, except what he has done. And so Paul was constantly battling this um, problem with people trying to impose what he called a yoke of bondage. He wrote to Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and let me just kind of give you a, a few perspective. He talked about a day when, uh, in the last days, I mean, the last days started on the day of Pentecost, and so it continues. But he said, understand this, that in the last days there shall come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. Put this, think about this on TV. Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, kind of, kind of, kind of get the point there. But in, he, in, in verse 5, he says, uh, having the appearance of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You know, in our day to day, we can sort of do the same thing. We get caught up in religion. I usually wear a suit, you know, when I'm speaking, but I didn't want anybody having a flashback, you know, kind of from their youth, you know, and some religious institution or whatever. And being a Vietnam veteran, I, I, I know flashbacks. Uh, I used to tell people, you know, in my pre-Christian days, you know, if you sit on a plane with somebody and, and you want them to shut up and so you should have bring up that you were in Vietnam, and then I would say, man, if it wasn't for flashbacks, I wouldn't have any memories at all. And uh, you know, eventually they would kind of move away. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, I occasionally get off point here. But, uh, you know, we can try to live this sort of righteous life, keeping, uh, we used to say when I was, uh, uh, you know, a kid, just, you know, I, I I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls who do, you know? That our churches, you know, we sort of set this practice, if you do this, then you're accepted. But you know, here's the thing, keeping all that stuff, before I got saved, I was like one of these things trying to think that, okay, if I try the good stuff outweighs the bad stuff, uh, you know, then maybe I'm going to be okay, you know? Except in my case, the bad stuff was like way over here and I was not feeling, you know, real too... Too, too comfortable with what my future salvation is going to be. But, you know, here's the thing. Remember the story of, uh, this is in Matthew 19. Again, we'll probably forget I ever said this by the time we get to Matthew 19. Uh, but we're all familiar with the story of the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments, you know. And he cited, you know, honor your father and mother, do all this stuff. And, and this is what he said. He said, I've done that from my youth. What am I lacking? You see, this guy had it all. You know, we live in a society today with he who has, dies with the most toys win, you know. It's like, you know, he had money, he had position, he had the house, he had, uh, you know, probably the boat and the property on, you know, the Sea of Galilee. You know, he just, and he had it all. He did all that he felt he was supposed to do, but he knew in here that he was missing something. Because you know what? Just doing that outward form does not fill the emptiness that's in our heart as we try to live by a standard that, that, you know, Jesus never, ever meant for us to live. Here's, this is interesting. 
this is July 4th weekend, you know, we talk about independence. And I will tell you, the term independence from a Christian perspective, I don't think that's a good word to use. We had to fight for our independence to be free as a nation. But let me tell you, to be free as an individual, you have to surrender. And that's a big difference. Too many times I probably fought the Lord for a long time. So I finally got to that place where I finally just said, uncle. And I used to think that it was just guys have a hard time surrendering, but, you know, ladies, some of you have as much of a hard time surrendering as us guys do. You know, it's a hard thing. Christianity is about surrender. And, and, and let me tell you why. The perception that people have of the church today is not good. You know, we read in the very beginning how people came to Jesus by the thousands. They're not coming to us because they are not seeing in the church, with rare exceptions, uh, for the most part, they're not seeing that love. They're not feeling that love. And, and so they're not coming. And so this is Independence Day weekend. This is Freedom Weekend. It's interesting because it was 40 years ago, around the 4th of July, 1976, for six, eight months or so, I'm kind of struggling with this, you know, seeing Jesus for who he really was. And I finally just got down and I surrendered. I'm talking, you know, career marine officer, surrender, not in the vocabulary, you know. That was a big step for me. Jesus told his disciples, he said, who the Son sets free is free indeed. So I want to challenge you this morning. Let's close your eyes. I have two, two kinds of people here. Those who know the Lord, those that don't. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you. Take some time to surrender to him, who the Son sets free is free indeed, Jesus said. If you want to feel that emptiness, you want to experience the peace, and you want to experience the love that he has for you, then just give your heart to him. Just let him know that you give up, you surrender. You want what he has for you. And if you're a believer and you want to have that love flow through you to touch people you work with, people in your family, and say, Lord, I surrender to you. Fill me with that love. Come in and do maybe what I have not let you do, the work that you want to do to touch others' lives. Help us to have a freedom experience this Independence Day weekend, Lord. Do a work, Lord, that only you can do. Father, we want the world to see how lovely and how awesome and how beautiful you are. And they can only see that through us as we yield ourselves to you. So we yield, yield ourselves to you today. Have your perfect way in our lives, Father. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.